When you think of the best studios on the Nintendo 64, companies like Rare will naturally come to mind. And when you think of the other end of the scale, then it's probably Titus, who many people remember for pumping out some of the worst games. Known for their relatively low quality titles, Titus had an interesting history on the Nintendo 64. Developing four of their own games and publishing four others, it's safe to say that perhaps they are best remembered as a company that would try to balance their books by any means possible, even if it meant putting their name against a subpar product. And so for today's video we're taking a look at the 8 Nintendo 64 games published or developed by Titus. The four they made themselves and the four they acted as publisher for. But as always, if you're interested in a more in-depth look at some of these games on the list, then there are reviews to many of them linked in the video description box. Automobili Lamborghini was a 1997 release, both published and developed by Titus France. This game was a follow-up to their Amiga and SNES title Lamborghini American Challenge, and as an early Nintendo 64 title, it received mixed reviews. Some reviewers said the game was an acceptable third-party racing game, whilst others criticised the lack of depth in the gameplay and wished the game had more tracks. What's most surprising about this title is that there is actually a Japanese exclusive upgraded edition called Super Speed Race 64, which gives you much more difficulty, customizable controls and the introduction of real weather. This was distributed by Taito in 1998, who were presenting the game as the next entry into their Speed Race series from the 70s and 80s. In fact, it was the first entry into the Speed Race series since Super Speed Race Jr. in 1985, so some 13 years on from that series' last outing. Overall, I find it a easy game to pick up and play. Like the cruising series of games, it doesn't really take much to learn and it's the kind of game you can pick up and switch off mentally and just kick back and enjoy. I found the visuals to be okay for the time and the opponents are challenging enough without getting annoying and using cheap tactics. It's the kind of game you could complete easily in a weekend session and then not really feel much of a need to go back and ever play again. Of course in 1997 that was disappointing, but these days I find these type of games much more accessible with less time to play games than when I was a teenager. Xena Warrior Princess Talisman of Fate was a 1999 3D fighting game by the Sapphire Corporation which was published by Titus Interactive. Based on a television series, it was at this point nearing the end of its production, but I feel that it's an often forgotten fighting game on the console. The game sees you choose one of the many TV series characters and enter battle in locations which were also based on the TV show. The game is a fairly interesting experience, in a sense that aside from Smash Bros, it's one of the only Nintendo 64 games that offers 4 player simultaneous fighting for those looking for another great multiplayer experience. What helps the game is that the engine itself keeps the game running lightning quick and without any slowdown. The downside though is that there is a lack of depth in the gameplay to note and the fighting mechanics are fairly shallow. Of course you have your basic moves, the ability to jump and even run up walls if you get trapped. But the lack of depth in special moves really lets the game down, although it does stay true to the source material. What's always been odd is that the North American version of the box shows expansion pack support, whereas the PAL version removed it. Although the game doesn't offer expansion pack support, this was something that the developer touted in interviews during the game's production. They even noted how their work on Rainbow Six for the Nintendo 64 led them to experiment and experience ways that they could really best use the added RAM for Xena. They have stated that it used the RAM expansion pack for enhanced speed in the game, but it's unclear if this was ever implemented in the final code, or if it was just being used as another way to hype the game. Whilst I find the game to be one of the more enjoyable fighting games on the console, fans of the series will naturally find flaws. As I'm not a fan of the show, I haven't noticed that there are none of the cast offering their voices to the characters, but the voice actors do a fairly good job of replicating the real actors. This is something that Sapphire wanted to include, as well as samples from the TV show, but without going into detail they said that they couldn't work out a deal for that aspect. Overall it's a fun fighter on a console which lacks many good fighting games. It's not for die-hard fighting game fanatics, but for anyone wanting a casual fighter which is easy to pick up and play, 
and also maybe wanting to play with three other friends, then it's easily for me to recommend it to you, especially if you may be needing a break from Smash. Roadsters, or Roadsters Trophy as it is sometimes known, was both published and developed by Titus in the year 2000. Featuring cars from both licensed companies such as Lotus and unlicensed replicas to pad out the roster, the game also features 8 drivers to choose from, and by the time you unlock everything there are over 30 cars to choose from. As a multi-platform release I'd probably recommend going for the Dreamcast version, which has the best overall package, but the N64 version is no slouch. This one was something of a surprise for me because it looks nice enough, runs okay, and there's actually quite a lot of depth in the career mode which sees you earn cash by winning races and using it to either enter new cups, buy new cars or upgrade the car that you already have. Whilst the game is aimed squarely at the arcade feel, the weather conditions do add a little simulation type feel to the engine. That's because certain surfaces like snow can make certain cars you own almost unplayable such as rear wheel drives. The range of tracks are mixed and take place in interesting locations, and as many of the cars are open top, you'll see some cool driver animations whilst racing. Whilst the game runs in the standard medium resolution mode, there was a hidden high res mode which didn't require expansion pack support. Now I'll go into more detail about that in my full review of the game, but it's one of the only few Nintendo 64 games to feature a high res mode that didn't require the expansion pack. Albeit in this instance, it was accessed only via a secret code, and so it wasn't pushed as tight as actually having this feature. Overall though, like Automobili Lamborghini, it's a game which is easy to pick up and play, and although this time if you do get into the game, which I'm sure many of you actually can, then you have a fairly robust career mode to keep you coming back for more than just a long weekend. Hercules The Legendary Journeys was a TV series which ran for six seasons in the mid 90s. Although I wasn't a fan of it myself as I found Kevin Sorbo to be far too annoying, that didn't stop Titus from picking up the game for publishing which was developed by Player One. You'll take control of Hercules as well as many other characters from the TV show at various points in the game as you work your way through 12 3D lands to complete your quest. There's naturally a wide range of locations and enemies taken directly from the show and each character you play has their own strengths and weaknesses that you'll need to learn. Anyone hoping for a great 3D beat-em-up style adventure will be sadly disappointed. The fiddly controls, repetitive fighting and the general feel of the game makes it come across like a poor man's ocarina of time. Although the graphics are not at all that bad, it's the janky frame rate which keeps the game feeling dizzy to play and when combined with the camera that frequently flips out whilst trying to get itself in a playable position, it almost makes the game unplayable. The quests and puzzles contained in the game are more suited to the casual fan, but on the flip side, they are the most likely group of gamers to turn the game off, even when the tutorial level feels as challenging as completing a Rubik's Cube blindfolded. It's not a game I'd recommend, but anyone who's after a challenging adventure due to the game engine rather than the gameplay, then this may be a title you want to look into, just don't get your hopes up. Superman 64 was based on the animated TV series, but you'd be hard pushed to find any resemblances here because what Titus developed and published is often known as the worst game ever made. Come on, it's Superman 64. There's nothing more I can say about the game that hasn't already been said, just avoid this one. Blues Brothers 2000 was another game created by Player One and published by Titus. This one landed in the year 2000 after significant delays and no surprises it was based on the 1998 movie starring comedic legend Dan Aykroyd. Whilst the movie itself wasn't too bad, it offered a musical comedy that didn't live up to the original from 1980, also starring John Belushi. It was however a flop at the box office, and the Nintendo 64 game didn't arrive until the year 2000, totally missing any hype from the movie's release. Reading the N64 anthology interview with Eric Kane, he stated that Titus looked to create and publish games from IPs which were undervalued from a video game perspective. That's perhaps why this 3D platform game ever saw the light of day, because it's the kind of game which nobody was asking for. The gameplay is shallow, the controls and camera are a hindrance, and overall, it's just not a game you want to go out of your way to play. Reviews of the time were poor, and for the most part, I'd agree with them. Virtual Chess 64 makes another appearance in one of these videos, and keeping things brief, 
it was an in-house game both developed and published by Titus France. Whilst being a niche market, the game was never intended to sell to the masses, but for those who like chess games, this is one of the best, if not the best, console chess game of its time. With an incredibly intelligent AI system, tons of customization options, some interesting enough 3D animations, and a tutorial mode which can easily make you a great player step by step, then this is an easy game to recommend. I just don't think there will be many of you watching who really want to go out of your way to play this. Carmageddon 64 is a poor port of a great PC game. Coming from Software Creations and published in North America by Titus, the game is known as being perhaps the worst PC to console port of its era. Panned by critics and yet still selling on the strength of its name, this port of Carmageddon 2 had an additional level as a tutorial and just one exclusive opponent. In a funny note, IGN of all people gave the game a 1.3 out of 10 and said it was worse than Superman 64. GameSpot gave the game 2.3 out of 10 and said that the game has absolutely nothing going for it. My beloved N64 magazine gave it 8% and in summary they said that if you see a copy on store shelves, take it off, rip up the box and throw the cart repeatedly against the wall until it breaks. And I'd agree with them. So there you have it, the four games Titus made and the four others that they published. Surprisingly there's more of a mixed bag here in terms of quality than you may have expected. Games like Roadsters and Automobili Lamborghini show that Titus could make a decent game if they put their effort and minds to it. Then in the same breath they can give you a big FU and slap you in the face with something like Superman. The same is true for their published titles which have highs such as Xena and then big lows like Carmageddon. And so for today's topic of conversation, I'd love to know your best and worst Titus Nintendo 64 games. I'd personally put Roadsters at the top and Superman 64 at the bottom, but what do you think? I'd also love to know of any other memories you have of Titus games, good or bad, on other systems and platforms, as they were around from the mid 80s to the mid 2000s before finally going bankrupt and their assets being snatched up by other companies. So as always, let me know your thoughts, feelings and opinions in the comments section down below and until next time.